went to school there, from there, right through school and university, kept on running twice. And didn't know anything about um, slow schools so until I was in my forties. And then quite by accident, after I'd been running community organisations and choirs of different sorts for decades, I banged into the wall of schools. Um, just a parent of some children I was teaching, the parents had started the Arana Style School in Canada and they wanted a music teacher, so that's how I got into it. Um, and then I realised to my absolute joy that the school system thought music was important. Because all the private schools I had towing, you know, I only put a toe in the water in high schools and found them horrible places musically. They did not want beautiful music at all. All they wanted was kids enjoying themselves. They didn't want children to be taught what music was or to take it into a sort of real higher level. You know what I mean? It just the schools I was at, I would be as fast as possible to do. Primary schools I loved teaching at primary schools, but no primary schools <coughs> or the ACT believed it was important. So it didn't happen. I knew that was the age that children need to be taught music, but no schools wanted it. I studied music education in Hungary, the Kodai system, I was there for a couple of years, and came back really busting to start a primary school in music matter. Um, just as I've got a hundred grand who's all willing to pay for such a thing, Bork got in, which I thought was good in many ways, but he axed new private schools, so that was that. So then I gave up on that notion and just started community, community organisations. I had 16 different groups, different sorts of fire levels and different sorts of instrumental levels and all that stuff. So that was what I was doing when I banged into style education. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly thought, ooh, this is different. Everybody, all the teachers and all the parents actually believed that music mattered actually mattered to us as, you know, to each individual as a as an entity, as a person, as a soul. You know, it actually mattered. It wasn't just a sub-subject in the timetable. If you because you have to. Maybe in the high school maybe you have to. So I got really excited by that and stayed in the Arana style school if we know it they were paying me five dollars an hour for three hours a week, I taught full time. It was so fun. It was just fabulous. So I stayed there a number of years and then they got me um, money from the government to write a book of songs to start a school so I did that and in the process I didn't feel I knew enough so I visited a whole lot of starting schools in New South Wales to understand starting school better and that way I became in contact with all these other schools and all of these teachers in starting schools and started this lovely process of giving workshops around Australia and every place I go to every school I'm teaching the teenagers were the most exciting to teach. The primary kids were great, and they were really, you know, fun to teach. But the teenagers, you could begin to teach them the music stuff, you know. Um, and the boys were always two up in number than the girls. I mean, the ones who become voluntary. There'd always be two boys and thirty girls. And then you had a voluntary choir in a school, and that was set to boys. And after a few years in the Mount Barker Hall of School, oh sorry, I went from Banana School to the Mount Barker Hall of School for three years, and then I went back to Morana. So I had about nine or ten years at both of those schools. And every, every time I'd meet more teenage boys who loved it but were scared to say so because of the social stigma of saying that it was what they wanted to do. And so I thought I need to get these small number of boys together in the holidays so they can support each other and not feel so isolated. So I began inviting these teenagers to meet with me in the holidays in any part of Australia I felt like. We rehearsed for a couple of weeks and then we'd go wherever I felt like. And so that was the beginning of Wayfarers basically. The school that Barb was a student at when I met her, which was Mount Barker, that was where the seed was sown because we did a high school tour and that was a really funny one because I said to the kids, okay, we're going to go on tour from school time, and you have to come every lunchtime, so it's going to be lunchtime, and different two or three people would come every lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And then the day we left the school, there were 65 people in the bus, some of whom I'd never seen once. <laughs> <laughs> and um, many of whom I'd only seen once or twice. So when we stopped for a toilet break, we had an hour's rehearsal. <laughs> when we stopped for lunch, we had a two hour rehearsal. I went on like this for the first week. They were driving from South Australia to Melbourne. By the time I got to Melbourne and Melbourne, Victoria, they were sounding like a choir. 
by the time we got to northern New South Wales, they were excellent. People were throwing thousands of dollars at it. So that was the beginning of my realising that teenagers can like this sort of thing. And Barb's mum was the one who sowed the seed that we could chew up, we could actually travel. Mm -hmm. And so I left that school just because I had to for family reasons. I didn't want to leave because I loved the kids. So I had to leave. And um, I thought I'm going to get those Mount Barker kids to join up with the Arama kids. And then I also banned into some Linnean kids in Sydney and some Amadar kids where I was giving workshops to the teachers. And so finally we got this quite a big group of kids being, um, we call them Waldorf wayfarers. Wayfarers meaning you travel for a reason. You're not just sort of mooching around here for a purpose in what you're doing. Almost like a pilgrim in the olden days, you know? That's <coughs> And so we started. And in the year 2000, I did what Barb's mum had asked me to do. She kept on saying, you must go to Europe, you must go to Europe. And I thought, this is difficult. I'm not sure I could cope with this idea. <coughs> but in the end, I tried it. I wrote, it was pre-internet. I sent brochures I got printed to every science school in Europe and got about, you know, 10 or 12 interests. And then I got, thought I'd better go all around Australia and get teenagers. So I went to Perth and got 10 girls and one boy. Went to Brisbane and got one boy and two girls. <coughs> went to Melbourne, got heaps of people in Melbourne. So anyway, I got all these people together. We had a hundred, hundred people, mostly teenagers, a few parents and teachers. And I don't know if any of you know Benjamin Britten's Rejoice in the Land. Does anyone know that? It's the most extraordinary piece of music and extraordinary poetry. That was the benchmark. If a person could learn to sing their part in that, they were allowed to be part of this group. If they couldn't, sorry, bye bye, see you next time. And um, a very difficult piece of music. And my daughter is a drama and dance teacher, and she choreographed a beautiful movement for that piece. And my friend Renata, who had been a pianist, pianist for what there was in Adelaide, I said, have you ever played the organ? She said, no. I said, well, you better start. So she had a rapid, I think about nine or ten months of organ lessons. She was a very pianist. She just had to play organ, you know, with feet. And the amazing part with your feet and all that stuff. So she quickly played the organ. And then we went all around the great cathedrals of England and Europe doing this rejoicing the, the land by Benjamin Britten, the organ, and dancing was oh, amazing, <laughs> extraordinary. And we did a huge big piece of music by Hassler. Anyone know Hassler? 16th century <coughs> German composer, and it's an eight part polyphonic piece of music, two choirs, soprano, soprano, alto, 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 alto tenor, tenor, bass, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to teach this in our two weeks intensive rehearsal time to all these Perth teenage girls who were also doing each other's nails, you know? Mm -hmm. Nails, hair. Yeah. They had never heard of us, they didn't really want it. And I just had to pound it into their ears and I was thinking to myself, what am I doing this for? This is stupid. But I was, I'd undertaken it, so I just had to keep going. And then at the end of the tour, there we were in Germany in a school called Heidenheim Stein School. And the whole lot of the kids, nothing but me, put themselves on this huge staircase that was three stories high, went right up to the top of three stories. And they all just burst into this eight part polyphonic music and sang it right through beginning to end off by heart. Hello, Danny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if we do, call in the other room, I'm sure. Well, you go in there and do some practice. Okay. Okay. And then we can record our. Super. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so that, that showed me that all teenagers need is to be exposed to this stuff. And they won't have known it if you haven't shown it to them, you know? All they'll know is what the popular radio or whatever is going to feed them. That's all they'll know. And there's no point in just feeding them back what they can already get. You have to give them other stuff that you yourself love. If you don't love it yourself, it's a waste of time. But you have to give them what you love, and then they can learn to love it. And at least three quarters of that hundred kids have made music a separate part of their life since then. You know, it's 
then really pivotal. <coughs> so that was the beginning of weight bearers. And after that, um, because of the money, we all had to find our feet in Europe and back, and for most of that was a big struggle. So then we didn't get any go overseas for a little while. In 2003, I took 10 people around Europe for three months, and they were all excellent performers, and that was marvellous. And then 2006 and 7, we went to New Zealand, big group, and then a little group. And then 2012, I thought, mm, it'd be fun to go for a whole year, <coughs> to devote myself for a whole year to this sort of stuff. So I just put out the call to the people who'd been wayfarers. And at this point in my life, it was only Australians that were being wayfarers, even though we'd go to our places. <coughs> and occasionally, other young people would latch onto us, like there was a boy in Switzerland called Jonathan who latched onto us and travelled with us for three months, then they had to go back to school. And there was a young man in Finland who latched onto us and was still on Facebook and that sort of stuff. But essentially, it was Australians. Um, and we went on this 2012 trip. We first of all had 20 people in the criteria in this time. They had to sing their part in the Yosemite like, Weather by Bach. They had to sing their part impeccably against me singing any other part. Um, and if they could, they were in. So I got about 22 people. And they were great, musically fantastic. Um, and we did The Lord of the Rings as a play with all the music I've written for it, plus some other stuff, lots of other stuff. And we went around Australia, first of all, and then um, overseas. And we went to, just because my friend Terry, who was one of the people in it, said, why haven't we gone to Asia? We need to go to Asia. I said, oh, OK, I don't know anything about Asia. So we just looked up spinal schools <coughs> in Asian countries and sent by oh, this time it was emails. So we sent emails and got answers from quite a few. And so we went to Taiwan, and then China, and then Russia, and then the Baltic countries, and then Western Europe, and then England, Scotland, Orkney Islands, and India. So that was the 2012 tour. And that opened me up to what Asia is doing with spinal education and opened them up to what choral music is because they didn't really know, well, I didn't meet anyone that knew what choral music was until we got there. It might be just one of those flukes, but the schools we went to, they never met a choir, they never heard a choir. Maybe they heard it on telly or something, but they never actually met a bunch of humans who did it. And when they realised that average, ordinary teenage people can do this and can do it, they got very excited. And so ever since that 2012 trip, Taiwan and China and India kept on asking me to go back. And I've been back many times to each of those countries. And the Taiwanese people in particular have become so excellent musically that they joined me in quite a few tours now. We did um, my opera Marco in Taiwan and Japan. And then we did, then, we, then they all came to Australia for the tour of North and New South Wales, together with some Chinese and Japanese, I think that's it. And then in 2016, a whole group of just Taiwanese people, I took them to a conference in China that was an Asian language teachers conference. And then in the same year, about 10 or 11 Chinese performers joined about 10 or 11 Australian performers, and we went to Europe, we went to the end of the fringe and did the little kids, which I've been music to. And very southern. It was around Iceland and other nice places. Um, and then in 2017, um, a man called Fumi Hiro, that I met when in Japan, asked me to work with his students. And he wanted a piece of music here that would be meaningful to teenagers. And I couldn't find the right story. So in the end, I invented a story about a girl meeting a rather musical being called Gaia's Messenger. And that's the same thing I call though Gaia. That's out of this big piece of music that I wrote from two years ago. And um, anyway, so in 2017, I took about, about 20 Australians, and we joined up with about, oh, 50 Japanese people, wasn't it? Anyone remember? 50 Japanese people and about 20 Taiwanese, I think, and about 20 Koreans, and about 20 Chinese. We had a hundred at least, anyway. Um, yeah, do you remember? Something like that. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> and 
that they were fantastic. It was great. Mm -hmm. But then I thought we have to do this in Australia. So then I invited all the people that had done it before, plus any other spine people in the world, to come to Australia to do the same work. Plus I invited them to write new songs. So for the last two years I've been working on organising people to come to Australia and helping them organise themselves into composing. So this book that you've seen us using, this is just came out <coughs> four weeks ago, five weeks ago. This is the book we made of, half of it is the new songs that retros have written for our tour. Mm -hmm. And the other half is pieces I've previously written, all on the topics of how many in the world or how many three people. Um, Yes. The book is absolutely available, but they're all in Canberra, so the best thing is if people get my email and I can get <coughs> it here. Um, how can I give people my email? Okay, so talk to Barbara if you want a book and we'll, um, I'll post it. It's in here. It's there, is it? Okay, so probably it would be about $10 postage and $1.30 book. Yeah? Um, anyway, so that's how this this year's tour came about because I wanted to do the same work plus all the new songs we wrote, plus another piece I wrote for orchestra and poetry and dance. And so we did that, we rehearsed it five weeks ago, for two weeks, and then we toured. We had 77 people, so the Taiwanese people here, plus another four or five Taiwanese people that didn't stay this week, plus 18 from India, kids and adults, Eight from Japan, three from Switzerland, one from Germany, and about 20 Australians. So that group was great, and we performed right across ACT, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia. When we got to Adelaide, that was the end of that musical part of our tour. This is a little add-on that happened because most of these Taiwanese people had by now seen some of our major cities, but were saying, What's all this Central Australia business? What's all this Disney business? <laughs> and so we thought, okay, it <coughs> seemed a good idea for us to do the driving part of the drive anyway. We really wasn't sure about being the driver. So in the end, we thought we'd better get one of those people you pay money to. So we got one of those people. Mm -hmm. So we've had six days of swagging and all that stuff. And here we are. Mm -hmm. So we've been today at the Spider School. <coughs> um, and here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, awesome. yes. Okay. Uh, what we sing? Wait, what we sing? Oh, the Lake Air song would need help to be in. He's not. Yes, Mike, we've got sickness with both you and Mike, which will make it not from South <coughs> Yeah, unfortunately. Um, somebody from Wake Air, tell me, please. He's a yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. No, we can't because we haven't got enough of this. Remember? We've got some four things. Every night I do well. Possibly, but let's do one of three parts first. Three parts. Three or four parts first. How about we do. How about we do petrichor first? <coughs> and then we swim, and that we do. And this will work. Okay, <coughs> Petra call first and then be sold. Yeah. So, can I have the players who play a bit? <coughs> They had to sing me their own part 
Millennium by Music that I sent them. And um, once they were accepted, then they could, if they wanted to, think about writing or something. And this 13-year-old girl wrote the words and then sent me a sound file of herself singing <coughs> to her own tune. So this is Amisha's words and tune, which I've put on. <laughs> Oh, God. 
Christ denying. Yes, mankind is trying to keep the beast flying, though some beasts are dying through mankind's denying. But we Thank <laughs> you. 